I'm Malika. Good to be Josh, with you. Welcome. Thanks for being here. Good to be here. You're doing very well with jet lag, having flown in from San Francisco. I'm faking it well. <laughs> faking it well. <laughs> faking it well. <laughs> well, I'm glad you could join us. So, Josh, your company makes eggs from mung beans. Yes. And you make cultivated chicken, cultivated meat. How do you make meat without killing an animal? That's the hard one. Uh, so, <laughs> Tell us. Yeah, so to give you context, there are tens of billions of animals around the world that are slaughtered every day for us to eat meat. And about a third of our planet is dedicated to planting soy and corn just to feed the animals we eat. Mm -hmm. Just think about it, a third of the planet. Um, so our challenge is, is there a way to feed people meat, not plant-based, but actual chicken flesh, pork, beef, lamb, without all that land, without all the water, without all the slaughter? And we start with a cell. So we get a cell from an animal, and we can get that from a cell bank, we can get it from a biopsy of the animal, we can get it from an egg. It's important, obviously, in this region to think about the halal implications of it, of which, of which we are. The second step is to feed the cell. So in the same way that a chicken or a cow would eat soy and corn, and the soy and corn, the amino acids and the vitamins and the minerals would allow muscle and fat to build on the bones of the animal, we feed our cells. And the term is called media, but it's just feed. Okay. Um, and then the third step is we put that cell line um, that is consuming the feed in a vessel, a stainless steel vessel that creates the conditions for the meat to grow. And after about a few weeks, we remove the raw chicken or beef from that vessel, and then we got meat. And that term is called cultivating meat instead of slaughtering meat. And we think ultimately it'll be the dominant way that we make meat in the future because it's safer, it's healthier, it's more sustainable, and particularly in a place like Qatar in this region, in Singapore, countries that are importing 90 plus percent of their meat, you don't need to anymore. You can develop mm. your own infrastructure, you can develop the innovation domestically um, and use it to build a resilient food system and then export that technology to others. Tell us how this is better for the environment. I mean, it's widely accepted that a plant-based burger, for example, in the process of making that, that it emits, uh, generates about 90% less greenhouse emissions. How is chicken that you cultivate better for the environment. Yeah, it's pretty similar. It really starts with just understanding how um, degrading the conventional process of producing animals is to the environment. So producing, um, slaughtering animals and making meat is responsible for more carbon emissions and all the transportation sources combined, right? So when we think about solving issues like climate change, if we only focus on moving to a renewable or a less carbon emitting infrastructure and we forget about food, we're missing a big piece of the puzzle. Uh, so it's similar in that it uses 80% less land, water, carbon emissions, and, and some studies. At the end of the day, though, we're going to require, and other companies are going to be required, to actually build the infrastructure, mm -hmm. measure that at scale to really determine what the, what the relative difference is. Um, but, you know, at the heart of why we do what we do, people love meat. It doesn't seem like people are going to eat a lot less of it. Mm. So how the heck do you figure out a way to allow them to eat meat just in a way that's better? And, and our idea is, let's make the real meat, let's just do it from a cell instead of slaughter. Are you driven more by environmental concerns, this is better for our planet, or ethical concerns? You're making meat yeah. without killing animals. I'll talk about me first and then, yeah. and then others. So for me, when I get up in the morning, uh, the, the driving principle for me is, why cause any harm if you don't need to? Hmm. A lot of times, as humans living on this planet, we have to cause a bit of harm to get on with our, our lives. Uh, otherwise, we're, we just wouldn't be here. Um, but I think we need to try to call, cause as least harm as we possibly can. And that includes harming an animal, and that includes tearing down a rainforest, uh, and that includes um, feeding the animals. We eat more food than we feed to the billion people that are going to bed hungry every night. So that, that's my motivator. I would say the primary motivator, it seems, globally today is actually food security. Yeah. So Singapore is the first place in the world to allow the sale of this new way of making meat. And we're the only company in the world that's ever received approval. We're the only company in the world that's ever sold. Uh, we sell today out of a single butcher shop, pretty small volumes, but nonetheless we're selling. Um, and Singapore has this, this initiative, 30 by 30, where they want to get 30% of their food produced domestically by the end of the decade. And they look at making meat in this way as a key part of that. Um, and we're seeing that from a lot of countries around the world. So food security, more than ethics, 
seems to be the driving force, and um, we'll go with it. Now, to really make a dent, when we're talking about the environment, climate change, to really make a dent, you need scale. At the moment, you're selling once a week through a butcher in Singapore. That, that's tiny. How do you hope to achieve scale? Well, number one is you need approvals. At the moment, you're only approved to sell in Singapore. Where do things stand in the US? Yeah, so I'll, I'll talk about some of, the, some of the challenges in actually making this available to, to billions of people. Um, so we received regulatory approval in Singapore in late 2020, and we've mm -hmm. been selling in very, emphasis on very small volumes Yeah. Uh, ever since, less than 5,000 pounds sold uh, since we started. So it's at one part historic that we're actually selling it, and at the other part, kind of embarrassing because we're not selling a whole lot. And very quickly, what's the price of cultivated chicken in Singapore compared to normal chicken? So we sell it, we, we sell it at the same price uh, as whatever chicken is sold at the establishments. We sold at restaurants, hawker stands. Okay. We lose money on every sale, uh, so the cost is much higher, but we, we price it at the, the price of chicken. So we received approval in Singapore. We received FDA approval in the United States. We're only one or two companies that received approval. And now we're working with the USDA to receive final certification before we actually launch in the US with a, an acclaimed chef named Jose Andres. Oh, yes. But to move from, all right, we're selling a little bit, to how does this become the majority of the meat that people consume around the world, a few big things need to happen. First thing that needs to happen is that the cost of the feed that needs to come way down. So in the same way that for chicken or beef or lamb, roughly 50% of the cost structure comes from the soy and corn the animal consumes, pretty similar when it comes mm -hmm. to cultivating meat. We're in the dollars a liter today. Ultimately, we need to get to the tens of cents a liter to be competitive. Second thing is uh, a measure called cell density. And basically what it means is the higher the cell density, the more you can make in a given period of time. So we need to get our cell densities up. And the third and the probably the most important and the most capital intensive is making it in much larger vessels. So today we make it in a vessel that um, is about, uh, probably comes up to the, the word future there, a little bit, little bit smaller there, mm -hmm. but ultimately we'll need to make it in vessels that are 100,000 liters, 250,000 liters large, that are about as high as the ceiling. That's a lot of engineering, that's a lot of uh, capital, um, and ultimately it's a big opportunity for places like Qatar. That's also going to take a lot of power though, so to really be environmentally friendly, you'll probably need to power that in uh, an eco-friendly way, otherwise we'll need, you're not going to be environmentally friendly. Yeah, we'll, we'll certainly need to use, whether it's natural gas, or renewable sources to do it, but it really does allow countries that might not have the land and the resources mm -hmm. to have a large infrastructure to produce animals, like where we are today like Singapore, um, it allows them to really jump ahead and leapfrog with this technology, um, and, and we, wanna, we wanna see that happen in our lifetime. This is fascinating, and I want to remind you all that we are happy to take questions. So if you do have any questions, please get your phones out and submit them, and I'll try to get to as many of them as, as I can. I would, I would imagine one of the questions, just to, to jump ahead of it, is does this taste like chicken? I was gonna end with that and, and say, it, <laughs> what does it taste yeah, like? Yeah, it, it definitely tastes like chicken because it is chicken. And this is the right. key point of why this is different than maybe uh, you know, tofu or a plant-based uh, plant product. Yeah. Cultivating meat is real meat. It's just made in a different way. And if you think about how we produce beef today or how we produce chicken today, it's done in a much more effic efficient, dense, high technology way than it was done 80 years ago. And we look at cultivating meat as just an evolution of that, right? We're able to make ultimately in the future billions of pounds of meat in a much more efficient way uh, without all the issues. Uh, but at the end of the day, when you're sitting down with your friend and having a chicken dish, mm. it's chicken. Mm -hmm. It's not trying to be chicken. Now, some enthusiasm for these alternative meat alternatives has come off, whether it's uh, with consumers or even with investors. Do you think this could just be a fad, or do you think we are at the start of a really big seismic change in the way we think about meat alternatives? Yeah. I think when you step back, you know, out of the, the daily headlines and the, um, the, the, the daily opinion pieces, and you just look at some of the facts. We have uh, eight plus billion people on the planet today. More people reading meat today than they were yesterday. We use a third of our planet, I'm gonna say it again, a third of the planet mm -hmm. 
is dedicated to planting soy and corn just to feed the animals we eat. Not me and you, just the, just animals, the, animals. Just the yeah. animals we eat, a third yeah. of it. And that's only going to grow. More emissions are caused by all the animals we eat than all the transportation sources combined. Big food security issues associated with here. How do we solve it, right? We could solve it by asking people to eat more beans, mm. which I highly encourage everyone in the audience to eat more beans. We could encourage everyone to eat a lot less meat, which I highly encourage. Or we could do something that I think is a bit more practical, which is let's figure out a way to make real meat in a way that's better. And I think at the end of the day, that question has to be answered. Uh, and whether it's by what we do today or by a new technology that, uh, you know, chat GBT 10 <laughs> uh, yeah. comes up with years yeah. from now, it just has to be solved. We can't, we can't ignore it. Food is central to who we are, what we do, how we live. Um, and meat, it's the, meat is at the heart of that. We've got to solve it. This year, we're seeing rising food prices. We're seeing commodity prices remain high. Millions of people are going to be pushed further into food insecurity. Is there a role for your technology? Um, can your technology help solve the problem of food insecurity? So I would take two elements of food security. So one is food security as it relates to a place like uh, Qatar, mm -hmm. Singapore, importing well over 90% of its meat, and there's yep. a role right now. Uh, places like Qatar can build a new meat infrastructure to fulfill, fulfill domestic demand and then export today. We don't need to wait for that. The second is food security as it relates to folks that are living under $3 a day, people that are dying of hunger, who are dying of malnutrition. That's a longer term uh, process. Ultimately, we need the cost of chicken, beef, lamb, et cetera, made through cultivating to get significantly below the cost of conventional meat. Now, if we can do that, and that's a longer term objective, we think ultimately it can help people that you know, might not be getting enough of uh, high quality protein sources today. I was surprised to read that China is uh, supporting um, cultivated meat and its Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Affairs in January this year released a five year plan in for the first time, it included cultivated meat and future foods as part of its blueprint for food security. That really surprised me. Do you have your eyes on China now? For sure, yeah. We have a, a, a partnership with Alibaba, who's an investor, and a partnership ultimately to go to market uh, with Alibaba in China once cultivated meat uh, get, gets approved there. So on one hand, it's surprising. On the other hand, if you think about it from the perspective of someone in government in China, um, it makes a lot of sense because China right now over the last years has been buying up farmland in South America and the United States and Sub-Saharan Africa explicitly to plant soy and corn on that farmland to feed animals that are, that are housed in big warehouses in China. And it's an example of if you just step back from the habit of today and you just ask yourself, what's the most efficient way to feed the world meat? And you sort of get out of what we do today. I think most thoughtful people would say, well, you wouldn't have billions of animals. You wouldn't need to buy farmland all around the world. You wouldn't need to use a third of the world to plant soy and corn. Mm. You'd cultivate it. Um, right. And I think China's seeing that. And uh, I think the countries that end up not only seeing it, but actually going for it and building the infrastructure are going to add a big boost of innovation and job growth and uh, competitiveness in the future. So I, I, hope, uh, I hope more get at it. We have a great question from the audience. You've spoken about the benefits of cultivated meat. Are there any health risks? The, the health risks for cultivated meat are pretty similar to the health risks of conventional meat. Because it's grown the same way from an animal cell. So cultivated chicken, which we sell today, has cholesterol. Cultivated chicken has saturated fat, and cholesterol and saturated fat are correlated with heart disease. Now, in the future, what we would like to do is to make meat that's actually healthier from our cholesterol and saturated fat perspective. Um, other safety benefits, though, of cultivated meat are there's little to no risk of zoonotic disease like avian flu, um, microbiological uh, elements like salmonella, uh, E. coli, uh, fecal contamination are absent or at levels mm -hmm. that are not relevant. Um, but we're in the very early days of doing this. Um, is that today, we're the only company that's selling, um, and we're only selling once a week to about 20 people. Right, So right. long way to go. Would you be willing to provide help and infrastructure or assistance to poverty-stricken countries? 
In the future, yeah. I mean, right now we're allocating all the capital to make this happen. To make it, yeah, to, to make <laughs> to, it, to make to, it happen. To develop it. Uh, yeah. But but ultimately, I, I spent time in Liberia, and Kenya, South Africa, Nigeria, at different points in my life. Um, and when I was staying in Liberia, there was a group of security guards that were outside the building I was working in, and they only had meet once a month, hmm. and it was the day they got paid. Right. So ultimately, we would like to build a meat infrastructure that radically lowers the cost of meat for people, makes meat healthier, not only benefits countries like Qatar and the United States, but it also is benefiting some of the poorest countries around the world too. What, another question from the audience, what form does this meat come mm. in? And it reminds me of, you know, when people say, if it doesn't bleed, it ain't meat. Yeah. So, <laughs> You yeah. Know, what, what does this look like? Like, what form does it come in? Yeah. So about about a trillion dollars worth of meat are produced every year, um, and about half that meat is ground beef, um, minced chicken, and the other half is what you think of whole cuts. So a whole steak, um, you know, a whole piece of fish. Mm. So today, this cultivated meat comes more in the minced form, so more in the ground up form. Um, and uh, as we continue to develop technology in the future, we'll structure it into steaks. So it'll have much more structure, much more fat, much more interconnected tissue. Uh, but the very first product that we sold in Singapore is about the simplest meat product you can make, a chicken nugget. Oh. So it right. didn't get any simpler than that. So we started right. with a chicken nugget. Now we've moved to a chicken strip. Uh, we're working on a chicken breast, and we'll, we'll keep advancing it. We've talked in every single panel at this forum about AI in some way or the other. Tell me something, what role do you see AI playing in solving food security? Mm. Yeah, I think in the future, pretty significant. You know, there are a lot of, whether it's the design and the engineer of the vessels that we make the meat in, whether it's optimizing the kinds of components that are a part of the feed, you're dealing with a lot of data, right? And to the extent that machine learning techniques and AI can help us more effectively sort through data to make smarter, quicker decisions, it's going to be relevant. Um, we've used it to, to some extent uh, earlier in the company's lives, and, and I'll bet we'll use it in the future. Three of the co-founders of DeepMind, uh, mm -hmm. the company that was acquired by Google that is one of the leading AI companies in the world, are actually investors in the company. Um, and uh, I, think it'll, I think it'll play a pretty important role. But you know, invest enthusiasm for protein-based, I mean, for cultivated meat has come off in the last two years. Are you at all worried about uh, investment drying up? I would think of, when you think of alternatives to meat, there are these different categories. So one is plant-based. Yes. Uh, the other is fermentation, and the other is cultivated meat. Um, and um, I think um, you got to look at sort of investor appetite for three of them individually as opposed to collectively. That, okay. That's one. But second is, um, no offense to any investors in this room, but whether, whether investor appetite is high for it in 2023 or 24 or, you know, back again in 25, this has to be solved. Unless you think people are going to move to beans, unless you think a lot of people, including all the folks in this room, are going to eat a lot less meat, we have to solve this because we don't have a planet that can support the way that we currently make meat. So my, um, my optimism for capital is at the end of the day, we need to make things that work for the planet that consumers are going to want. Uh, and ultimately, I think those kinds of things are going to provide the kind of return that investors want. So I think, uh, I think it's a good place to invest. We're out of time. We could have gone on and on. We're out of time. Thank you for joining us. But there was one point raised by the audience that yeah. it was a suggestion Try making Wagyu beef, please. That would be a game changer. Well, you know, you know, before, before last thing I'll say is we're, we're partnering actually with a company called Toriyam in Japan who makes a very high-end kind of Wagyu. They say it's very high in oleic acid. <laughs> so, so there you go. <laughs> and uh, that'll, that'll, uh, that'll, that'll come be out. a game changer. That'll come out soon. Great. Josh, thanks very much for Thank being you. here. Pleasure to speak with you. Thank you. Thank you.